Are you ready to radically renew your mind and to transform your life? I am, and I know Corey is. <laughs> Absolutely. We are so honored to be with you on Hope Today. I'm Amy Schaefer, and this is Corey hey. Langford with hey. the coolest haircut <laughs> today. Listen, I have to always make sure I'm sharp to be able to talk and communicate <laughs> with everyone here today. Listen, I am so excited. I don't know if you could tell by the smile that I have, but I am ecstatic today with our special guest, Dr. Alan Weissenbacher, who is all the way from California. And we are so excited because his book, The Brain Change Program, is incredible. I encourage every single person that you must get this book. He breaks things down so incredibly well for us to be able to understand how to do this walk in Christ and how to renew our mind. And what does that actually mean? I love talking about the brain. Yes, it's so complex and interesting. Today you're going to discover the six steps that can renew your mind and transform your life. You're going to learn how to reshape, reorganize, and change harmful thoughts into healthy ones. Come on somebody. Yes. And you will learn why it's important for us to pray forward and not backwards. That is coming up today. I tell you what, this is going to be a great like buckle your seatbelts kind of program yes. today. I'm ready to learn. I'm going to yes. sit in the seat of a learner today. You have to. You have to because it's so it's so needed. Uh, Dr. Allen talks about so many key areas that in scripture we sometimes read over and we say, well, God, how do I do that? How do I become the person that I need to become? And so, you know, it's like when we think of self-improvement and, 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 and in our minds, we're often wondering, okay, is this a willpower thing? Is this a willpower thing? Is this something that I have to do through a mental and intellectual thing? But just understanding this six step program through this book, we are able to understand how to go into those steps and do this. So we are so excited to truly have Dr. Alan Weissenbacher here today with his book, The Brain Change Program. Dr. Alan Weissenbacher, listen, hey, welcome to Hope Today. So excited to have you here today. Thank you very much for having me. Listen, we have a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to kick this off. First and foremost, listen, tell us about the Brain Change Program. Please tell us what prompted you to write this book. Two things prompted me. One was just for myself when I'd read verses say, that say, take every thought captive and renew my mind. Easier said than done, mm -hmm. especially when you're lying in bed and you can't quiet your thoughts. How do I do this? And so I wanted to learn specifics. And I looked into how God designed the brain to learn and grow for those specifics. Mm -hmm. I was also a pastor to homeless addicts for many years. And these people came to me with damaged brains. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know how can we help them, these clients of mine, renew their minds so that they can overcome the addictions and the problems and the pains that they carry. Wow. There was something that you had said, and there's so many points, so many things I took note of. But one of my favorite was when you talked about the Paul program and the Jacob program. And I'm so grateful for that because I feel that a lot of believers uh, get frustrated because they're not changing as fast as people would expect them to change. And so can you break that down for audiences? What is the difference between the Paul program and the Jacob program? The Paul program is the program we all want. This is where we're zapped into instant holiness. We're changed immediately uh, through the power of God. Does this happen? Yes. Is it rare? Yes. And if you, you haven't been microwaved into holiness, then you're probably on a different program, the Jacob program. Jacob, it took him... 14 years of working for an uncle who was just as deceitful as he was for his character to change, which was then symbolized by the wrestling with the angel and having his name be different. That took 14 years. And this is the crock pot type of change. And that's what most of us are on. And I encourage my clients, encourage other people, if you're frustrated that this slow process of change who would you rather have as a mentor? Someone that was transformed instantly or someone that fought a long, hard fight and came out victorious? Wow. And that is so incredibly encouraging when I was reading that because I used to get jealous at people 
that seem to get it with God just like that. You know, God speaks into them, they just, it's just popcorn, they just get it. But just to know that Jacob program, that there is grace for the patient walk. And sometimes people just don't get it that quick. So let's go into the brain. Uh, tell us about how neurons work, where they go, and how they can influence our behaviors. Well, the brain is not a machine. It's always growing. It's always changing based upon what you think and what you do. New neurons are created in your brain and they travel to the areas of the most activity. Hopefully it's areas of living like Christ and not anger. And so if it goes to that area, it says, oh, there's so much activity, let's build it up and make it stronger. If it goes to a non-active area, they just say, you're not, I'm not needed here, forget about it. And this makes big highways in your brain for those pathways that are the, that are the most used. It's like a muscle. You strengthen it. You build up a pathway into a large highway. Like for a former client, it might be alcohol that they've built up through many years. And now it's a huge highway. And so when life throws them a curveball, your brain is going to take the big highway because it's the easiest and it'll take alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so to change your brain, you need to direct yourself off that highway onto a small path. Mm -hmm. And the example would be sobriety. Mm -hmm. You might have to Direct yourself off of it 60 times a minute when you start. But every time you redirect, you take one brick off the highway and put it on the path. And so hopefully you weaken the highway you don't want, and then you build up the path you do. So the next time a curveball comes your way, your brain will take the healthy Christ-like path. This is so good for, for listeners because one of the things about, you know, changing and going through that process is while the person who's going through it is, is taking this journey and having setbacks here and there, they're connected to people that love them. So their defeat feels like failure to the people like, you're not changing, you're not changing. I, you had said something about triggers in the book and a guy who was, no, some who were going to church, the sound of the gospel music was triggering them because it sounded like the rock and roll times back when they were using their drugs. And I thought that that was incredible. So when we talk about triggers, there's often setbacks. How can you encourage someone who's had a setback that feels like, you know what, it's not a waste? How do you encourage them when they've fallen short, when they've, when they've been good for so long? You've been working on brain construction. You've been pulling bricks and moving bricks in your brain, rewiring, and then you fall. And this is not unusual. Your brain can still try to take the old way. But if you get right back up, you don't lose the construction you've already done. It's not like, okay, why did I do all that hard work? It's, I've just failed, throw in the towel. If you don't stay down, you don't lose the construction. If you get right back up, you can pick up where you left off and you're not back at square one. Wow. That has to be so encouraging. I, I pray that people really have received that um, because people do get discouraged, and especially like in a marriage or anything like that. If a person relapses into a state of mind, it's like, oh, you know, you're never going to change, that type of thing. So you said a, 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 a quote in here that says, pray forward, not backwards. Can you please under, uh, explain that for us more de in more detail? Uh, to start explaining it, I just need to let people know willpower doesn't work. Mm. Anyone who's tried that knows that frustration. And there's a biological reason for that. Because if you're using willpower, you're telling yourself, don't use alcohol, or don't be anxious, or don't eat that giant bowl of peanut M&Ms. What are you thinking about? The alcohol, the anxiety, and the peanut M&Ms. And so what you and so that way you are strengthening that very highway in your brain because you're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. You're making it worse for yourself because you're thinking about the problem and making the problem stronger. And so I tell people you need to replace, don't resist. Mm -hmm. You need to turn your brain to something positive instead of going the willpower route. Mm -hmm. And then I relate this to prayer. Mm -hmm. Praying backward is praying focused on the problem. Dear Lord, help me be free from alcohol. You're praying about the alcohol. You're thinking about the alcohol. You're making the alcohol highway larger. Wow. But if you pray forward and instead say, Dear Lord, help me be sober. Mm. 
dear Lord, instead of anxiety, dear Lord, help me be a person of peace. Let me experience your joy. And by focusing your prayer on the positive, that is building up the positive paths in your brain. And I'm saying it makes it easier for God's power to work in your life. Don't pray backward and makes it, a pro makes it worse for you, but pray forward with the solution so your brain is changed in that direction. Wow, wow. it's such an incredible conversation. I, I absolutely love this, which I believe segues us into one of the steps that I love and exercising the power of imagination. And just reading, uh, you were talking about some examples of people that when dealing with temptation, imagine yourself being victorious. Imagine what you would do when it comes because things are going to come. Temptations are going to come. <coughs> so let's talk about a little bit more about why imagination is so absolutely essential with healing and victory through our walk with Christ. Now, this was a big surprise for me when I was doing the research. Your brain cannot tell the difference between imagining doing something and doing it for real in terms of how it changes your brain. And all of a sudden, all those verses in the Bible make a whole lot more sense when you're told in Philippians 4.8 to think of what is true, noble, good. That's changing your brain. Or it says, if you have lust in your mind, it's like you're committing it because it's changing your brain. And so I tell people, you need to be imagining doing good. You need to be imagining resisting temptation, not giving into it. You can say, oh, I would never do that in real life. Well, maybe not now, but imagine it enough, and you move yourself ever closer in that direction. And so, like with a client who was worried about relapsing uh, by running into an ex, mm -hmm. you say, okay, that's your fear. Start imagining what you will do if that happens. He was fine on several weekend passes, uh, but a, a couple months later, he runs in, pastor, pastor, I ran into an ex. She was at an open air cafe down in Denver and was, had a beer in front of her and she waved, hey. And, but next thing I knew, my body had turned around and I had ran two blocks away. <laughs> and before I even knew what was happening. And he's still sober today, but he had trained himself to do that in his imagination so that when temptation hit, his body just reacted automatically and to, do, to do the right thing. Wow, you are dropping some serious nuggets. <laughs> now, I have a question. I mean, what if somebody is sitting there thinking, I think my brain is okay. Do I, does everybody need a brain change? And what are some of those triggers that's like, it's like a warning sign. I need help. I need to change my brain. Well, I tell people, don't do this solo. <laughs> Get people on your brain change team. Uh, trusted people. I always thought, okay, my brain is pretty good. And then I got married and through my wife's feedback realized there's some places that I need to change my brain. I was a lot pickier than I realized. I had a tendency to be negative, but I needed that accountability and feedback. And then triggers, which you mentioned, these are things that I call brain knots in your brain. That's when two things happen at the same time they can become wired together mm. in your brain. Uh, an easy example would be anger and a person who hurts you. Someone hurts you, you feel anger, that gets wired in your brain because those two things happen at the same time. Mm. And then you tell yourself, I've forgiven them, why do I still feel so angry? It's biological. That's been wired in your brain. And the way to break that, and that can be a trigger, you see that person triggers anger. Mm -hmm. You need to put a new emotion into the knot to begin to loosen it. Mm -hmm. to, to go back to forgiveness again, the Bible tells us how. Science is catching up to the Bible. It says pray for your enemies. And so by praying for them, you're taking a different emotion, sticking it into the knot, and that knot can begin to loosen. Does it happen overnight? No, it's a process. It's a discipline. It's the Jacob program. But you do that enough, that knot will loosen and break. Wow. Listen, you, woo, this is so good. I, I, <laughs> this is really so good. There was a segment in the book, you talked about the Amish community 
forgiving the one who had murdered those girls, those young students in that school and how they literally program forgiveness. Can you talk about that a little bit for the viewers? Well, in that story, uh, there was a number of years ago, there was a mass shooting in an Amish community uh, where a shooter killed a bunch of school children and then killed himself. Shortly after that, the Amish community was offering forgiveness. They were going to the funeral of the shooter and just like, how can someone possibly do that? That is superhuman. And the reason is, is because they, were, they train their children in forgiveness exercises from a very young age. And so they are growing this giant highway in their brain for forgiveness. And so by the time they're an adult and something huge happens, they're able to forgive did they still feel all the pain? Yes. They're human. But they were able to forgive because they had that built up in their brain beforehand. Mm -hmm. And so what I tell people, start doing the right thing now. Build up those paths. And say so you have some gigantic forgiveness thing in your life and you wonder, why can't I forgive? Well, are you trying to run a marathon right out the gate? Mm. This might be more than your brain can handle at the moment. So start small, start with these sprints, start with a small forgiveness, and that will begin to exercise your brain, build up that highway, so that eventually you will be able to forgive the bigger things. You just have to get there first. I feel like I'm sitting in the office of a, of a Christian psychologist. <laughs> So I thought I would give you a real life example, talking about the knots that we create in our brain, which that is quite a visual term. I think I've got a lot of knots um, and, and forgiveness and really, okay, so let me give you a real life example. Okay, I'm a pastor of a church. Things happen constantly where just an anger will rise up, you know, or something frustrating. Then I go home to my kids and they might be mildly annoying, but man, it's weird how I can attach that hurt of the day into my kids. What emotion, you know, and there's many people, they're, they're hurt at work and then they're coming home with their spouse or their kids. How, how can we unknot that and create a new pathway? What do we say? What do we do? One, there are ways you can try to block the knot at the outset. For example, with me, I can be prone to being an anxious person, a worrier. But I have sat with the verse about God taking care of the lilies and the sparrows so much that that has become so ingrained in my brain that when I start down that route, I just get a picture of a sparrow or a lily right in my brain. So it just dominates my whole brain vision. Mm, and that just so stops me from going down that path. Because I've prepared myself beforehand with the scripture and training in my imagination. And so I would tell someone, I mean, being able to leave the stress at work is a big deal for a lot of people. You don't come home and take it out on your family. One, give yourself some space after work. Do something different. The replace, don't resist. Take some time on your commute to listen to something positive on the radio. Uh, if you're working from home, before you go downstairs out of your office to see your family, take a moment to do something different to, into that little block before you make the transition. And that can begin to weaken the knot. Read some scripture, listen to something positive. Take a moment to pray, praying forward before you do something new. Dr. Allen. This, this conversation has been so incredible. I would love to continue this conversation so much further. Before, before we go, where can people find you and access to your book? Uh, the book is available on Amazon, The Brain Change Program. And you can go to, the brain, go to brainchangeprogram.com. That's brainchangeprogram.com. That's got purchase links, a little bit about the book, and at the bottom, a place where you can contact me personally uh, and get updates on the book or ask me questions. So brainchangeprogram.com. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. It has been an absolute pleasure. I will continue to get into your book. Thank you for joining us here on Hope Today. Thank you. It's been a joy. Lesson. Wonderful. Listen, stay with us because when we come back, we'll take a look at a particular scripture that can be quite challenging for most of us to apply to our daily lives. We'll be right back. Whether you're reading God's word for the first time or the 40th, you're bound to ask questions along the way. Why can I be confident the Bible is reliable? Who decided which books made the final cut? What else do I need to know? For new and seasoned believers alike, the ultimate infographic guide to the Bible delivers invaluable historical, cultural, and contextual insights so you can better understand scripture. Don't miss this special offer when you support the gospel ministry of Cornerstone Television today. These fascinating charts, graphics, and timelines will highlight key events, themes, and applications provide background on the Bible's reliability and translation process, and equip you to understand its relevance to you today. Give your best gift and request the ultimate infographic guide to the Bible at 888-665-4483 or online at ctvn.org donate. Make sure you set your DVRs and you tune in to re-airings of His Place weeknights from 1.30 a.m. to 3 a.m. That was such a show that I did years ago, over a decade ago, playing Marcus Dupree. I had such a wonderful time. Listen, this conversation today was phenomenal. Oh. I am, I'm full. I want to talk about it even more. I need to unknot some things. <laughs> unknot. And create some new pathways. Yes. That whole visual of like, we're building this huge pathway and then your default's going to go to that big high. I'm thinking there's some things I need to stop today and some things I need to start yes. today. So hopefully this is a great reminder for you as well. Let's read 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. This is so good. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. Come on. I mean, yes. we take captive. I mean, yes. if you take somebody captive, yes. you are, you're grabbing it and controlling it and moving it to where you want it to go. And I mean, we cannot just let every thought, and mm. I'm preaching to myself, Come we on. cannot let every thought that comes across our mind just plant and land and create a pathway. It is a real neuro pathway. I know for myself, Corey, you know, he talked about, you know, being anxious or fearful. You know, mm -hmm. I have, you know, three teenage and young adult kids. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm not ready. I mean, I'm just <laughs> telling you, it is like a mind battle every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, the kids are just all in different directions and, and I'm like, God, I thank you. I have peace mm -hmm. in my mind. Because you just, I think about the kids. I'm not going to say I worry about the kids because mm -hmm. I'm not going to pray backwards. I'm going to pray forward. <laughs> there you go, there right? you go. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot we can learn today. Yes. And, and what I love is, is, is the subconscious healing and subconscious victory. Now, there's conscious of what we're thinking and what we're doing right now. Hey, you're watching us and talking and all this. But then there's the subconscious thoughts and belief systems right. that get planted into our system. Right. And that causes us to behave a certain way. Right. Because you can go and say, hey, you know, Jesus has forgiven me, but subconsciously, you haven't forgiven yourself. Mm -hmm. Or subconsciously, you're still not healed. And so that subconscious internal narrative is going to speak louder than what we actually say. You know what? The scripture says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Mm -hmm. So eventually what has been marinating in our heart mm -hmm. and germinating and developing and all that is going to eventually come out through our confessions about ourselves yes. and our internal come belief on. systems. But I just believe that with the help of the Holy Spirit, the Bible, the Word of God, and this book here, the Brain Change Program, listen, you have to get this book. You will be able to understand the steps of how to reform your mind, how to understand to say, I need this new mind in Christ Jesus. Because mm -hmm. I used to struggle with that. I was like, I just really want to take Jesus' brain and just, and just put, put it on mind. my brain. But it literally is through repetition of the word of God. Right. 
and reforming that brain system. And so I just want to encourage you out there right now who are like struggling. It's that like, I have been struggling with this for years, over and over. I get up, I fall down. I get up, I fall down. I get up, I fall down. One thing about getting up and falling down is push-ups. It's resisting gravity. You're getting stronger. You may not seem that way. And, and for a lot of people, they get discouraged because they say, you know what? I've been falling so many times, people don't even believe that I can change. And they start saying, you're never going to change. You're never going to stop drinking. You're never going to stop smoking. You're never going to stop. And I don't want to limit this just to drug abuse or, or alcohol abuse. I want to talk about even phone addiction, even a negative thought process. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been around someone and every time you get around them, it's just negativity. Yes. It's just depression. It's yes. just anxiety. We can be addicted to certain thoughts that make so us true. feel normal. Yeah. There's people who are trained to find the negative thing in everything. It could be the sunniest day, beautiful out. Oh, it's too hot. You know, it could be great outfit. Oh, it's just a little spot. There's a little wrinkle. On. Training your mind wow. to literally be addicted to negativity. Yes. So we need God to infiltrate those places when he tells us what to think about. Whatsoever things yep. are lovely. Whatsoever things are of a good, good. report. Whatsoever things Pure. the Lord Holy. creating our brain, yes. telling us. I mean, even for you. How do you, have you found ways to change a repetitive mind process into one that God honors? Well, and just like you were talking about, mm -hmm. those, that subconscious, yeah. it reminds me of like the ocean, the undercurrents. Mm. There are, uh, there's an undercurrent mm. of your, the way you're thinking, the way you're, and we know what you're thinking by what you're saying. And then we can see the fruit of what you're saying by the life that you're living. So, mm. I mean, you, you got to make sure that that undercurrent mm. is like, if you're struggling with health, mm -hmm. your question, you, just, you know, and, and sickness is trying to pull you under and take your life out. Mm. You have to say, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Mm. He was wounded for my transgressions. And you have to put God's word all over those thoughts. I'm not going to have enough. I'll never be enough. I'll never, I'll never make enough. I'll never have... You've got to stop that undercurrent that's going to take and suck your life out. And you've got to replace it with, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want or lack for any good thing. You can do it. You can change your brain. You can renew your mind and you can transform your life with the word of God. And that is hope for you today. On tomorrow's Hope Today, be encouraged to pray what you really feel. Author Julie Lopes shares how to pray scripture's words of praise, conviction, repentance, and protection over your children, your community, and yourself. That's what's on tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.